a group called Farmer Veterans. He has a very interesting trajectory in how he has learned the skills that he wants to share with people. And I think you will enjoy what he has to say. So without further ado, here is Sven. Good morning, everyone. How, how is everybody? Um, I'm just trying to navigate uh, sharing screen and all that fun stuff. Um, so my business name is Connecticut Edible Ecosystems. Um, I'm presenting today on edible landscaping. Um, generally through the permaculture realm, I design differently than this, um, but see, uh, we'll, we'll see in the presentation how, um, how aesthetically pleasing uh, an edible landscape can be. And this is primarily using material from Charlie Nardozzi and Rosalind Creasy. They both have books out. Charlie's is uh, foodscaping. Rosalind Creasy's is edible landscaping. Um, let me try to figure out how to share the screen. Okay. Uh, and, and Sven, could you yeah. rotate your computer a little bit so we don't get that uh, harsh backlighting? Um, or, yeah, that way. Uh, yeah, can you do it some more? No. Uh, I'll have to go the other way. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 a good deal better. Okay. Um, let me see. Can somebody on your end fix the screen sharing? Just. Sorry about that. Yeah, let me. That's okay. Do that for you. Okay. Here you go. You should have it now. Okay. Are just trying to figure out what you are seeing versus what I'm seeing. We see the we see uh the, the first slide. Only the first slide? Uh well yep. Edible Excellent. landscaping and a nice picture of a beautiful garden slash okay. flower bed. Um, so the majority of the work pre presented here, um, I put uh, hyperlinks at the bottom as to where I uh, obtained the material from um, uh, out of respect for those that have created said material. Uh, so, so we see right here, there's a beautiful uh, edible garden with kale and other brassicas and so on in it. Um, if we're looking at edible landscaping from the aesthetic side, this is basically it. I work primarily from the production side and uh, the eco ecosystem benefit side, uh, carbon sequestration, pollinators, food production, uh, water management, all of that in the same general realm. My workshop uh, coming up this afternoon will touch more on the permaculture practices and tools and systems that I use to design uh, landscapes that I work on. Um, and I believe that the thought process um, that comes through permaculture is perfect for this. <clears throat> and um, so I guess uh, let's begin. Uh, and before we begin, oops, I'm trying to scroll. There we go. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to honor the Quinnipiac peoples whose land I currently live on and am presenting from. Uh, we are all on stolen land and should keep this in mind. Um, okay, there we go. Hmm, my forwarding is not working. Um, so today I'm going to cover in this presentation uh, food and landscaping history. What is edible landscaping? Uh, what are the types of edible landscaping? I'm not so much going to go into uh, animal plant annual plants and perennial plants, uh, that's a whole nother realm. And that um, basically comes from the distillation of uh, the scale of permanence, uh, which I would, will work through in, a, in, a, in the workshop this afternoon. Okay, I'm gonna have to, there we go. Okay, uh, edible landscaping is the use of food producing plants in a, in a residential landscape. It combines 
fruit and nut trees, berry bushes, vegetables, herbs, edible flowers, along with ornamental plants into aesthetically pleasing designs. These designs can adopt any garden style and may include anywhere from one to 100% edible species. Oop. Uh-oh. Something's going on here. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to switch over to a thumb drive. I was trying to do this through a network, and I think that's where my error is occurring. One moment, please. Okay. Um, can everyone see the next slide? Uh, Rosalind Creasy. Okay, excellent. Uh, Rosalind Creasy writes, the first gardens, of course, were motivated by survival, not aesthetics. Um, we've generally moved into the realm of aesthetics. Uh, I'm not necessarily the most pleased by such um, because we're not taking into account uh, historically uh, pollinators, wildlife, our own uh, nutritional needs. And um, I also live in the bedding plant capital of the world. So, uh, you know, it's all about use under the dining room window and hostas and, and other plants. Um, but uh, I think we can move back or find the middle ground. And that's what edible landscaping is to me. So agriculture began, uh, I, I have this, <laughs> Agriculture began in the uh, Zagros mountain range on the border of Iran and Iraq, uh, often called the Fertile Crescent. And um, scientists always had long assumed that these early farmers were a homogenous group that traded and intermingled, swapping farming tools and tricks. Um, but basically, it's also, there are different groups of people moving from hunting, gathering, foraging, to agriculture across the world. Uh, new studies <clears throat> are showing that multiple groups of people in the Fertile Crescent started agriculture, and these groups were generally distinct from one another. They didn't intermingle at the time, and at least not for a few thousand years. They lived more or less in a similar area, but they stayed isolated from each other. And these are still getting messed up. So some of my uh, notes are continue to, every time I save the file, things get readjusted. So this is an image of an Egyptian garden uh, around 1400 BC. And tomb paintings depict well-to-do Egyptians. Well-to-do is a key word there and it shows us our, uh, shows us privilege. So uh, well-to-do uh, Egyptians, where was I? Um, with uh, pools of fish, grape covered trellises, flower beds, fruits like figs, pomegranates and dates. Um, the Persians perfected on this by using geometrical design that invited outdoor entertainment. Uh, those that, that adopted these practices were Indians uh, and the Moors and then the Romans. Um, geez, everything's getting cut off. Uh, in the medieval era, after the fall of Rome in 400 AD, villa style gardens disappeared only to reappear with Christian monasteries with gardens basically in the same style. Common practices included grafting fruit trees, raised beds, and what we see today um, with fish ponds. Um, I wanted to look into a little bit further the grafting process, process or the history. And I know I've seen uh, history from Asia, I believe China, that goes way back as well with their grafting practices, but then that gets into some of the really geeky technical aspects of this, and uh, we don't have the time in this uh, presentation for it. Um, the pastoral landscape came up next. In the early 1700s, it was a reaction against the controlled look, which means man manipulating nature, uh, with influence from China, I'm sorry, with 
with influence from Asia, prompted by the English to develop a softer, more informal uh, view of landscaping. And then we've got our uh, European edible gardens from the 1700s to the 1900s, where French gardeners were more practical and developed gardens that were both decorative and functional and vegetables were interplanted with flowers and geometrical shapes that lined with boxwoods and espalier fruit trees. <clears throat> so what we're basically seeing is uh, privilege and affluence uh, intermixing uh, aesthetically pleasing plants with uh, food production. And I don't know truly what the amount of food that came out of these systems was, um, I didn't see any information on that. Um, and here's an early American garden recreation in uh, Virginia. Um, colonist priority was survival. So went back to growing edible plants brought from Europe and uh, they later appropriated the growing of corn, beans and squash from indigenous peoples. But we see how we went from the aesthetic side back to function again and production. I wanted to uh, also note that there were entire civilizations with e ecologically based practices, such as those living in the Amazon River Basin, um, where it has been found, where they have found 4,500 year old food forests um, that were in production at that time and at times still to today. Um, and that's based upon the, the, the way plants are spread. Um, and there's also a 2000 year old Moroccan food forest discovered in the seventies that's still in production and feeds upwards of 800 families. So I'm basically just trying to share different peoples at different times have put together different practices for food production. And it's primarily uh, through affluence and privilege that some were able to uh, intermix uh, aesthetic, aesthetics, and some, some systems are pure function for survival. Um, so this is uh, an image of the food forest in Inra, Inra, Inra Ren, Morocco, uh, that feeds that 800 families. Um, so in, this is not the right slide. Uh oh, what's going on? Something's going on here. One second. Let me just. Darn it. Now a bunch of slides aren't showing up for some reason. My apologies, everyone. Um, let me try to fix this again. I'm sorry about that. That's uh, the issue with uh, not paying attention <laughs> at times and um, uh, working between two different computers and two different systems. So I have to open this up again. Sven, don't worry about it. Technology does this to us all the time. Let me just... Uh,
Huh. So. Are you still with me? Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, still, we're still with you. No, I don't know what is happening. One second. I got to go check my other computer. Well, Sven. Yes. Sven, why don't you just um, talk us through it? Okay. Uh, I've, I've heard you talk <laughs> about your work before, and you do fine. Okay. So basically what I have found is uh, edible landscaping, especially through Rosalind Creasy, has been broken up into different categories. Um, so we've got container gardening. We've got, um, let me just find a pretty slide to look at. We've got islands. Um, so that would be like in between pathways, um, kind of like this image that's being shown right now. Um, foundation plantings. So that could be uh, like one would use boxwoods or use along uh, a fence or their home. Um, blueberries or raspberries or other perennials of that nature would be planted along a foundation. Um, just trying to think of some other methods. Uh, one of the things that's definitely taken into account, and we can look back at a slide. Oh, geez. So here we've got this beautiful purple kale. Uh, I believe this would be a dinosaur kale. I can't really see it that well on, on in the small image. Um, some uh, collards or cabbage. And we've got some flowers, uh, marigolds, and some other plants in here that are very aesthetically pleasing. These look like hostas here. And um, they can be intermixed. So one of the main things with this, and again, it comes down to aesthetics, is working with a color palette um, and intermixing plants that that stand out pretty strongly against each other um, based upon their colors. I would say one of the difficult aspects of this type of practice is basically in the design itself, understanding how these colors work together or don't and using that in the design process, that is actually something I have not seen as much of in um, this practice. So it seems like it's a subset of the practice, probably more on taking the professional level uh, landscape design and all the aesthetics, that, aesthetics aspects of that and applying that to annual and perennial plants. Um, in my designs, I would do something of this nature where the understory uh, plantings on the ground would be uh, pollinator plants, um, be food, other food producing plants, dynamic accumulators, plants with deep tap roots that, that bring those nutrients up in their leaves. And then when that plant sheds its leaves or when those plants are cut, um, those leaves are placed back on the ground, the leaves decompose, and percolate back in the soil. So you're basically mining nutrients from uh, well below the soil level or the, the surface level back up to the surface level, level and then allowing it to percolate back in. There'd be pest confusers, um, plants that would deter, let's say in this case with all these brassicas, a plant that would deter uh, those cabbage moths and other plants of that, I'm sorry, other insects like that. Um, here we would have, uh, looking at the architecture or the multi-strata aspect of, of this planting, we have a tree. This could very easily be a fruit tree. One of the issues with that is you'd want to ensure you have access to the tree um, and that anything to the north, let's say if the, if the sun is out this way, anything to the north um, would have to be or should be more shade tolerant due to the canopy of the tree. So we're looking at this three-dimensionally um, and also in understanding uh, basically shade patterns, light and shade patterns, um, understanding the, the, the three-dimensional or the, I can't remember what axis now, uh, you know, the height of something, how far it casts a shade, a lot more of this is gonna come up in, uh, in the workshop later. Um, 
I'm trying to think of what else to add to this. I would say the best bet is to look through seed catalogs, Johnny's, uh, Baker Creek, uh, fruition seeds, others, and look at the images of the plants. Um, so there's a, there's an there's a plant there's a image uh, I believe it's called Garden of Eden out of uh, England. It's got beautiful rows of different plants. There's alliums, I believe there's some, some type of onion and uh, brassicas. Uh, say it's kale in just these linear rows. So one of the issues with that is you're putting a plant that's right. That's the same type of plant next to a plant uh, that's, I'm repeating myself, but that is the same. That makes it very easy for insects to move from one space or from one plant to the plant right next to it. Um, so I would say referring to companion planting guides, as well as the aesthetics of these plants and the nutritional benefits and all that um, would be very important to have um, a healthy garden. Soil health is so incredibly important. I use um, uh, the Bionutrient Food Association, uh, Dan Kittridge's ent entity, uh, based out of Massachusetts, but pretty much spread across the country now. Um, for the, So basically, I, I take a soil sample. I send it out to Logan Labs. They give me back uh, uh, the, the results of the soil test. I then go to enter that information into Organic Calc, which is a, a subscription-based service. That gives me uh, better numbers on, on what I need. And um, again, a lot of this is tied to agriculture, not necessarily home use. And uh, then that has to get all broken up into like square footage and the amount of amendments that should go in the soil. So the goal there is to have your soil be as healthy as it can be uh, to provide uh, that health to the plants, which then become your, becomes your health. Let me see. Um, and so I get my nutrients and so, or I work with uh, the Bionutrient Food Association on that. I'll send them the information I received from Logan and Organic Calc, have uh, folks there um, analyze that. There's some changes they've made. Rock dust is one of the main things in there. Um, and we want to pay attention too to the fact that 40 to 70 percent of the nutrients in our farmland soil have been depleted and they're not being put back. And the main, if we look at it as vegetables, mining nutrients from soil, and I say mining because those, that matter, that vegetable mass does not make it back into that soil. Um, it makes it into people who then put their waste into the sewage system that gets treated and then water goes uh, elsewhere. But those nutrients have to be replaced or else we can't, we're not just, we're not gonna get that in our food. We can do that in our landscapes. Um, some farms I know are doing that, <coughs> but not, not that many yet. Another thing we wanna pay attention to, and especially with our leafy greens and um, is, is basically lead contamination. So it's recommended that leafy greens do not get planted along the foundation of a house out to about 20 feet due to the lead uh, from the paint over years uh, accumulating in the soil. It uh, affects young people mostly, um, or lead, lead poisoning does. But uh, so gardens that have leafy greens like, like these should not be placed directly at the foundation of a home. Um, 20 feet out is recommended. Lead tests are not expensive. That can be done as well. Your fruiting plants, much like, and I'm not a scientist, I'm more of a researcher. Um, fruiting plants supposedly do not uptake lead like uh, vegetative plants. Um, and like a mammal, because their fruit is the the housing or the food for its offspring, which is the seed, the mother plant is protecting its offspring by storing the lead in her body rather than passing it on to the fruit, which is the food for the seed. Um, so uh, I do plant fruiting plants within that 20 feet, um, but I generally do not plant uh, uh, leafy greens that can be mitigated too through raised beds, 
amending soil, um, basically digging out soil and bringing soil back. But the issue there also is dust. Um, I'm trying to think, what else can I add to that? Um, a lot more comes up on the design side in the later workshop. We're actually really walking, we're gonna be walking through the scale of permanence and the step-by-step um, on how to do a site analysis and uh, the process for design, which will feed a lot more into what should get where, what should go where. Um, and hopefully by then I'll have fixed my uh, technical difficulties. Um, how much longer do we have? Adam? I think you have about five more minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, about five to 10 minutes and then uh, 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Okay. Um, are there, is there anything in the chat at the moment that I can answer? Um, well, a um, couple of questions. Okay. Uh, how can root systems interactions be taken into account is one question. Okay. And uh, another question is, could you briefly share what the principles are of edible landscaping? Okay. Um, so root systems, I would say that that comes, we would want really want to look at, and that actually brings up a, another thought, but we want to look at uh, the companion planting guide. A lot of that is above ground on how uh, plants interact, but I, I believe it's also tied to underground because the, the way plants grow, and I hopefully I'm not uh, mentioning something too basic, is you, know, you have sunlight uh, working with a plant's leaves that cr and it creates sugars and those sugars are then pumped into the soil by the roots. Those sugars then feed bacteria and other life in the soil, which, and then that bacteria and so on, it lives, it dies, it goes to the bathroom, it does all of that. It breaks down nutrients in the soil along with fungus. And then the roots take that back up, turn some of that into carbohydrates, which go back up into the leaves and that cycle continues. And some of it goes into the building blocks of the plant itself. <clears throat> so we can look at like uh, when we tap maple trees, that's literally that carbohydrate uh, pulmonary system of the maple tree going from, uh, and it also acts as, as a, uh, 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 an antifreeze, um, but that's moving around that tree regularly. That tree's putting that stuff into the soil um, to feed, feed bacteria, which as I mentioned, uh, feeds life in the soil, which in turn feeds the plant. So a lot of this is in cycles. I wouldn't worry so much. Well, I would say definitely look at companion planting guides. That's uh, probably the best bet for understanding root systems. But that also had me thinking about like call before you dig and other practices. Um, you know, where is your septic system? I personally don't have an issue with growing over a septic system unless I have to. And I wouldn't do this for a client per se, unless I had like some very, very clear conversations with them. But um, uh, you wanna know where what is underground on your site, because say this tree that's in the image, that could very easily uh, clog up aspects of your leach field and so on and so forth. And uh, I wouldn't suggest planting trees, but shallow rooted plants over a septic system, I personally would do because I'm basically providing them free food. I won't be, I mean, I might pay more attention to root crops, but, um, and, and their uh, proximity to uh, human waste. But uh, the way I look at it generally is that that waste is feeding the soil, which then feeds the plants. And I've seen, you can see that if you look at somebody's yard, these stripes of, and, and the height of grass or how fast the grass is growing, um, if it's growing over a leach field. And so if it's feeding that grass just fine, uh, why not have it feed um, my vegetables? And I've also, there's a, a composting operation in Haiti 
there are some Yale students uh, were working down there and they basically developed a municipal like kind of a porta potty type system over a 55 gallon drum that was uh, collected composted and then applied back to the fields i would say it's a bit different than using malorganite um which is uh, made from municipal sewage waste um it's that that's something i don't use in gardens um i generally follow organic standards um, but and malorganite is different. Plus, a lot of people in other countries do not take the quantities of medicine and 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 things like that that we do. So um, that that can become an issue. Uh, what was the other question again? There's the a few questions. The principles of edible landscaping. So. But the way I'm looking at it, the way I, from what I understand, and this is kind of combining practices, is truly what are, what is the client's goals? What is, what is the landowner's goal? Um, and for that to be created, and I'll get a little bit more into goals uh, in, in the later workshop, but for that to be created is, is truly like, what do, you, what do you want? How do you want to live your life? How do you want to be seen by your neighbors? Um, so some of this comes out of a, uh, uh, like the lady before me was presenting holistic management with goal setting there. Um, this comes from permaculture and landscape design with goal setting. But and the hard part with this is we're not actually taught this. We're taught, in a sense, something different. You know, like, what do you want to be when you grow up um, is not, I mean, it, it's a question that's asked, but there's no development of that thought process through our growing up. So that it, that tends to be a very difficult aspect in working with clients. Um, so I would, I'm gonna get into that again a little bit later, but it's true, I think it's, you know, how much do you want to, how much of your yard do you wanna eat from? And um, so I'd look at, uh, there's different uh, tables and so on for, uh, uh, how much food to grow per person in a household. I would say, you know, just pretend it's uh, six tomato plants for four people. I'm making this up. I'm not looking at it right now. I tend to use a lot of references. And, um, but if you're canning and preserving, you're probably going to want more. And, um, and then that's just one vegetable, but we can look at the, you know, I would suggest to one to look at the whole list. And now, then, then maybe apply that quantity the, or the quant, those quantities of vegetables to, let's say, square foot gardening. Um, that's another book. Uh, I can't remember the author. One second. I have it out here on the table or desk somewhere. But uh, square foot gardening, I think, is an excellent reference for somebody that's starting. Um, and it gives you generally pretty decent uh, uh, references as to how many plants per square foot. Then one can take the visual aspect of that plant in context to, you know, one tomato plant per square foot or and things like that and develop a, and, you know, and, and apply that to a scale version of their yard. And basically you're just taking, you know, images or dots or circles or whatever and placing them next to each other to create uh, basically something that like you see in the image there. Um, and that, that was some of the difficulty I ran into in, in looking through the material for this was um, having to bounce around from one book or manual to another, to another. <clears throat> um, but I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering that question. It really, uh, I still go, I, I mean, I've, I've been at this for 12 years now and I, I use my references. Um, they are so important. Um, and over the years I've found better ones than others, but none of this, if you're gonna do it right, um, it's formulaic, it's not cookie cutter. And that's something I think we really need to 
pay attention to. Um, and it's one of the issues I have found with horticulture and landscape design. Um, those practices is we're not looking at them multifunctionally. And a lot of it is cookie cutter practices. Um, and oftentimes it's because, and it becomes something that's shiny, you know, and, and we're kind of taught to chase after uh, something that's shiny or to one up our next door neighbors and so on. And we're not really truly meeting our needs in that process, nor are we benefiting the ecosystem. So Sven, excuse me for one second. Sure. Could you uh, stop the slideshow? Sure. So we can, you know, talk to you more directly. Um, Just unshare your screen. I'm, let me find that. I think I may have found what was going on with this uh, PowerPoint as I was doing that. Where is, there okay. we are. All right. So My, Sven. Yes. There's an interesting question about when removing plants or parts of plants for harvest, you'd get bare spots. Do you have favorite strategies for keeping the design attractive throughout harvest cycles? So we can look at um, succession planting in that regard. So I would remove a plant. And so we got to keep in mind when we're planting this, and this is one of the, the issues with the images I was seeing, um, you've got this row of purple kale or dinosaur kale or something of that nature, and you're going to harvest from that. So some of those you just take leaves off of, you're not taking the entire plant out of the ground. Um, but you are correct that, uh, there will be, I mean, at some point in time, you're going to be taking all the leaves off that kale plant. So I would be looking at succession planting and seasonality, um, as well as if that doesn't fit, then planting, um, the same plant or another one, um, in that spot when it's ready. I would also recommend, especially on the, on the annuals, just cut them off at the, uh, at the root level, at the at ground level, and leave the roots in the soil because that's food for the soil. That will break down, and um, there's some that can be a little bit, um, you know, some that really want to continue going and will put shoots back out. But most plants, uh, once you've taken uh, all that matter off the top, they pretty much uh, die, and the roots feed the soil. Um, one of the things I was thinking about with these systems is weeding and weed control definitely plays a role in, in any type, type of production system. Um, so wood chips could, um, as a mulch, do not put them into your soil, um, leave them only at top. You can scrape them away, um, plant, you know, another kale or, or something of that nature, but also, um, like I've, I've mentioned uh, square foot gardening, I've mentioned um, uh, Rosen Creasy and uh, uh, I don't remember the other gentleman's name, um, but looking at all of this material and putting it together. But in this case, I would, I would look at succession planting because there are uh, a lot of plants that fit into that realm. And so you can even design for that as well. So your garden changes theme of uh, over the season or over the growing season. Um, I, I hope I answered that question correctly or as wished. Very helpful. Sven, there's a question from Yulia Rothenberg. Have you talked with Stephen Barstow who has a tree forest perennial garden? I was lucky enough, Eric Tonsmeyer uh, of perennial vegetables um, and Edible Forest Gardens 1 and 2, uh, he uh, reached out to a bunch of us that are connected to him, and he had Stephen Barsta out at Polio Community College last fall, or I believe. And um, I do have his book, uh, it was Around the World in 80 Plants. Um, I believe he has trialed three or 4,000 different edible perennials um, in, I think he's in Sweden. Um, you know, definitely a little cooler than here, but he's along the water. So it's, uh, temperatures are managed there. Um, he's got a lot of good information online. Um, he's a vegetarian, so that makes it 
I mean, I can understand his drive for uh, having diversity uh, on his plate and in his landscape. Uh, so, Steve, yeah, Stephen is um, an interesting fellow. Okay. Now, I'm honored to have uh, met and trained under um, basically every, I mean, I'm everybody that I have uh, trained under. Um, and one thing, here's something I suggest, and I have thousands of hours of, of, or tens of thousands of hours of training. And let's say it's on soil health or it's on apple trees or whatever it may be. I suggest taking courses from different people, but on the same subject. So let's say it's on soil health. Um, I will learn of problems and solutions from multiple angles because we don't all think the same. So one presenter educator will look at it from, from the left and one will look at it from the right based upon how they have found a problem and then found a solution. So by taking courses from multiple, the same course from multiple people, you end up with a broader toolbox or a larger toolbox to get answers from and knowledge from. So when you, when you let's say somebody calls me on an issue um, and I show up, I, I basically, because of the way I, I've planned my education, I've been a, I'm able to look at things from multiple angles. Um, and I, I think that's a great tool um, for others. Um, Diversity oh, is always a positive thing. Yes. <laughs> Can't have enough education. Can't have enough education. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm looking at the chat here now. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. So this. Okay, I saw the bare spots. I see Comfrey in there. Comfrey is a great uh, dynamic accumulator. I see that comment. Um, I see Stephen Barstow. Yep. Yeah. You can. You can que question about seaweed as a mulch. Yeah, somebody mentioned too, uh, putting a container plant in bare spots temporarily, that works fine. The only thing I would say is just pay attention to that plant. You're, the plants that are in the soil, in the ground, um, are basically all getting generally the same amount of water. But a plant in a container, just like a raised bed, due to the fact that it's above the soil line, will drain faster. So that will have to be watered more often. Um, seaweed as a mulch, I have not used it as a mulch. Um, I'm actually looking to. I live uh 10 miles from the center of new haven and then um it's maybe another two miles at the most to the ocean um i might not get seaweed from right here i'd probably go to more because we're in we're in the sound um to more open ocean areas rhode island um uh and you know load the truck or whatever but um, I do use kelp in as a soil amendment. The only thing I don't like about using, I mean, and kelp is great. It's uh, basically got every trace mineral in it that, that plants need. The downfall is you have to till it into the soil and tilling destroys the architecture of like what lives where in the soil strata. And so, and you can also make them, um, uh, like a, not a compost tea, but make a tea from kelp um, and pour that on plants. It's a great uh, probably foliar feed. Um, but I like I have I do have some kelp in my garage. I'm going to be working with some clients and, and actually tilling it into the soil. But everything after that um, generally kind of side dress the plants with it. Um, yeah, kelp is great. Probably one of the Probably one of the best plants out there for uh, a garden amendment. Somebody mentions here uh, putting it in a compost pile. That is good too. Definitely get the salt off. Rinse the salt off if you're uh, picking up seaweed. Um, sand, I wouldn't worry about so much, but the salt um, can cause some serious issues. And there aren't many plants that are edible that are salt tolerant. I because I live near the ocean and or working with projects that are along sidewalks or roads. Um, and we salt our roads here, that 
that really becomes an issue. Sven, we're asking speakers to give us a list of their books that they think people should look at and resources. So after the conference, please send that to us and we will be making it available to everybody. Oh, along, excellent. along with all the other speakers, books and resources. There was a slide somewhere <laughs> that had all of that on it. So real quick, it was Rosalind Creasy's uh, Edible Landscaping. Um, well, you don't have to do it now, okay. Sven. Okay. This is for after. Okay. okay. I'll send it. Okay. Thank you so much, Sven. And thank you for having me. I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. There was a lot more in here um, to share different styles. I recommend um, the books that I mentioned already so that folks get a stronger idea. They don't seem to be that technical. They're very image-based. And, um, and I'm hoping that, you know, between container, I'm sorry, companion planting, succession planting, um, looking at seed catalogs to see what these plants look like um, as adults, um, paying attention to sun and shade and water um, and soil health will provide the best benefits. Okay. And Let's people who want some more detail and more of a, how they might go about it can come to your workshop. Um, yes, yeah, that's at uh, one o'clock this afternoon. 1.30. 1.30, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Great. All thank right. you for having me. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Sven. So everybody, you now have uh, a relaxing, luxurious 15 minutes for lunch. And we'll be back here at 1230. And um, you'll hear Iona Connor and Rachel Berger, who have some great stories to tell as very long-term activists. <laughs>